whatever it is that we are doing, its eternal value, its ultimate worth, is all down to God. Please do have a seat. The names are Warniford, Bavistock, Longmore, Chesworth, probably don't mean uh, very much to you, uh, but any self-respecting former member of the RAF's 201 squadron will know something of these men. In our old squadron headquarters, rooms were named after them. Their pictures hung on, on the walls, logbooks and, and keepsakes were on display in, in cabinets. Tales of their exploits recounted and passed into, into legend. Warniford, the first pilot to be awarded a VC for aerial combat of, of any kind. His story is amazing. He was over, over Belgium and during the First World War. He was a, trying to attack a Zeppelin. He kept getting forced back. He came over the top of it. He, he dropped some bombs on it. The Zeppelin exploded. His plane flipped off. It was damaged. The fuel pump was broken. He landed in enemy territory fixed the fuel pump, took off again, and got home for tea and a VC. I mean, it's boys' own stuff. These memories on, our, on the walls of our squadron building were our way, if you like, of remembering and, and, and honouring those who had faithfully and extraordinarily served their squadron, served their, their country, their king, their queen. Well, this evening's passage from 2 Samuel 23 is a bit like that. Verses 8 to 39 record two sets of men, they're known as the three and the thirty, whose bravery and effectiveness and, and loyalty to the king made them worthy of special recognition. Earlier on, we only heard read uh, 8 through uh, 23, so if you can turn back to that now, it's page 276. Page 276, and if you glance down a little bit further to verses uh, 24 through to uh, 39, which is also part of our text for tonight, uh, you'll see that I spared Jane uh, the joy of reading a plethora of unpronounceable, well, she had a few, but there's a whole plethora of unpronounceable Hebrew uh, names in, in that list. It's one of those lists, isn't it, those classic lists that God likes to throw into his word uh, from time to time. And I don't know, but, but maybe at first look, maybe at first listen, you're thinking, well, yeah, that is quite interesting, but I really don't know uh, how relevant that is uh, to my life. And to be fair, initially, I, I would have had some sympathy uh, with that. But actually, on closer examination, as is always the case, I found a few things. I found five things for us tonight that I want to draw our attention to. So let me pray and uh, ask for the Lord in his, for his help in do doing just that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you show us what we need to see tonight, what we need to take note of, and how we need to change in light of it. And we ask that in Jesus' name, and for his sake. Amen. Well, let's get straight to it then. Verse 8 of uh, chapter 23. Verse 8 says, These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. And what we get first is a list of the three. Verse 8, Josheb uh, Beshebeth, let's call him JB, it'll be easier. Uh, verse 9, we get Eliezer, and verse 11, Shammah. And these three seem to be the best of the best, if you like, when it comes to David's warriors. And we're given a little insight as to why. So, according to uh, verse 8, JB was uh, a Tachymonite. He was uh, chief of the three. He wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. 800 men at once. That would make you the chief, wouldn't it? That would make you the boss. Next up is Eliezer. He uh, stood his ground when uh, all of the rest of, well, the rest of the Israelites just bottled it. If you look at verse 10, we're told that on one occasion, uh, he struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. Now, whether that's through cramp or through dogged determination, we don't know, but the inference is clearly that he wasn't letting go. 
I don't know about you, but I have this kind of Lord of the Rings battle imagery in my mind at this kind of description. The, the rest of the army, they're retreating all around him, but here is Eliezer with his kind of blood-splattered hand gripped to the sword through sheer determination. This is leadership to inspire, leadership from the front, leadership by example, and even so, his army are retreating. They don't follow. The cowards, we're told, returned only to strip the slain. That's Eliezer. Then in verse 12, we have the third of the three, uh, and that's Shammah. And Shammah took his stand in the midst of a plot of land, we're told, and he defended it, and he struck down the Philistines. And there's another example here of the Israelites fleeing. This is another courageous one-man stand. And lest we think, because we're told this was a lentil field, lest we think that Shammah was motivated by his love of of lentils, what we need to understand here is the significance of the place. And the significance of the place is that, that it was God's land. This was the promised land. And Shammah takes a stand, not just for his king, not just for David, but for the promises of his God by, by protecting what the Lord had provided. So there we go, three extraordinary men, three exceptional men whose exploits are still being recounted in Newcastle in 2018. And there's a lot we could learn from them, a lot, especially, I, get, I think, in the realm of the courage that it takes to, to stand alone against the odds, against significant opposition. And that must be part of what we ponder and reflect on as we look at these verses. But to press in that direction too quickly would, I think, be to miss the most significant parts of these descriptions. And and it's easily done. In my enthusiasm to recount these military heroics, I have passed over the most important phrase. It's actually there twice. And it is a truth we can often forget. That's our first heading tonight, a truth we often forget. Look at the end of verse 10. The end of verse 10 says that the Lord brought about a great victory that day. And then verse 12, again the end of verse 12, the Lord worked a great victory. It's the same phrase. In other words, despite these incredible heroics, something else was going on. The significance of these three stories and the rest that follow isn't J.B., Eliezer, or or Shammah at all. It is that the Lord was bringing about his victory through them. The source of their great acts was the Lord. He was then, and he still is now, the one who leads, the one who equips, the one who empowers, the one who encourages his people to victory. But you know what? I, I think that this is a truth that we say we believe, but actually in practice, we, we can forget quite a bit. And it occurs to me that there is probably no better evidence of that than in our prayer lives. If not personal, then I certainly think corporately. I mean, yes, it's a bit of a leap from from this text here where where prayer isn't mentioned at all. But is it not true that the the frequency of our praying, that the, the nature of our praying, that the fervency of our praying shows exactly how much we really believe God is in control? I mean, surely if we believe that truth wholeheartedly, we wouldn't stop pleading with the Lord to act day and night and I for one find myself so frustrated that I am not on my knees pleading with the Lord more every day to bring about these great victories for the sake of his kingdom what about you is this a is this a truth that you need to remember more often but of course remembering that it's ultimately the Lord's work does not negate the fact that we still have to get involved. These men men still had a part to play in response and in obedience to the Lord. And that's a reality that sometimes we can all too easily ignore. That's our second heading, a reality we easily ignore. And that reality is that, that the Lord uses people to achieve his his work and and establish his victories. We we see it throughout this passage, JB, Eliezer, Shammah, later Abishai, later Benaniah, uh, Benaniah, and, and, and by implication the 30 as well. They all had to step up and get involved. They all had to resolve to stand against the tide, to stand their ground and fight when all around them were running away. They had to choose what was true and right and eternal and of God and then do all they possibly could in their God-given human ability. 
And that's the reality of how God's kingdom grows. At one and the same time, it is both all the Lord's work and it's also us playing our part too in faithful obedience. The two, if you like, come together. And so whether we're serving in the workplace or whether we're looking after our families or whether we're reaching out into the community or whatever it is that we are doing, it's eternal value. It's ultimate worth is all down to God because he is in control. He knows what he is doing. And our human activity, our human achievement is, only has any lasting value in as much as it serves almighty God and his kingdom purposes. And, and we really have no excuse to ignore this reality, do we? We've been given our commission. We heard it read for us earlier. Jesus said, go, make disciples, baptize, teach, go, make disciples, baptize and teach. And, and the Bible teaches consistently that our responsibility as followers of Jesus is to work wholeheartedly to that end, as the Lord has gifted us and as he leads us. We may not be called to the, to the literal battlefield like these men. Most of us here will not be. But until Jesus comes back, there are men and women to reach for the kingdom. There is all sorts of work to be done for the kingdom. There's all sorts of work to be done to promote and, and, and to represent God's kingdom. Which means that we need to think about how we use everything we have responsibility for. Everything. Yes, our time. Yes, our money, those obvious applications. But also our energy. The talents we have. The gifts and the skills that we have. How do we use our bodies? And our minds? Everything that we have responsibility for. How are we going to allow them to be used by the Lord to bring about these great victories for his kingdom? If you're not sure where to start, then uh, maybe consider just how you'd answer some of these questions. You know, what interests you? What, what, what great wrongs bother you? What great injustices keep you up at night? What great passions do you have? What are the things that, that are naturally grabbing your attention? And maybe the Lord has laid something or, or someone on your heart now for quite a while and, and you haven't acted on that. Will you? Is now the time? To do that, you know, maybe it's, it's people who need a follow-up conversation or people who need a practical demonstration of love. Maybe it's a, a social or environmental concern that you know that you should do something about and, and actually you've got the means to address it. Maybe it's an attitude or a culture that you need to challenge at work, in your family, in the media. Maybe it's something in your own life that's, that's kind of burning a hole in your conscience. Well, whatever it is, will you, with the Lord's help and in his power, deal with it? Friends, part of what we see here in, in 2 Samuel 23 is that our work for the Lord, if it is truly for him and done in his power, will not fail to achieve what it needs to. And it also means that nothing, humanly speaking, is impossible. Nothing. 800 men in one day. If we saw that in a movie, we'd dismiss it as ridiculous. But we do need to step out and do something. And so the question we have to answer is, are we willing to obediently and faithfully play our part? Let's move on. Our next observation on this passage is that thirdly, there is a devotion we should rightly direct. A devotion we should rightly direct. This is verse 13 uh, through to uh, 17. And three of the 30 chief men went down and came about harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam. So we've had the three uh, who seem to stand apart from the 30, and now we have a story about three unnamed warriors who are probably part of the 30. Who they are exactly is irrelevant. Far more important is what goes on in this story. And we're not exactly sure when this incident took place, but what is clear is that David and his men are in the cave of Adullam and the Philistines, they're everywhere. Verse uh, 13 continues, 
that a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. Now, I want you to imagine what it must have been like to have been there, one of David's men. You're hunkered down in the cave. It seems like you're on the back foot again. Will you even, will you even survive this time? The Philistines are, are, are all over the place, and then someone brings the king bad news. Bethlehem has fallen. His hometown. He's distraught. And perhaps wondering where his supplies are going to come from, perhaps homesick, perhaps wishing that he could just turn the clock back to those simple days of his youth and all the cares of leadership and leading an army and relationships and all of that would just be long gone. Whatever it is, he begins to long for a drink of Bethlehem Spring. Verse 15. Verse 15 says, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. And there you are in the cave and you find yourself thinking, yeah, that would be good, Your Highness. But you don't take him seriously. I mean, after all, Bethlehem is, is 12 miles away and, and between there and you is the small matter of your enemy's army. Three of your mates, though, do. And they set off to make their king's wish a reality. Please don't miss <laughs> how, how incredible this story is. 12 miles into enemy territory just for some liquid refreshment. I mean, it would have been amazing enough if these guys had, had, had sort of decided to go covert and sort of sneak round the back and do a, do a round the back movement and come back round and bring the water back. No, not these guys, not these mighty men. Verse 16, they broke through the camp of the Philistines, they drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and they carried it and brought it back to David. Straight in and straight out. Ah, oh, yes. You know these men. I mean, you're one of them after all. You would do anything anything for your king. David is one of those leaders who, who truly inspires. The sort of leader you trust completely. The sort of leader you would follow without question. The sort of leader you would do anything for. I was in the, uh, in the RAF 16 years. In that time, I think I met one man who, who inspired me vaguely in that sort of way, who I would follow probably into, into battle unquestionably. I'm not sure I'd have done anything with him, that kind of anything for him. That, that kind of leadership is rare. So there you are in the cave. The cheering and the shouts on, on the return of these three brave men were, were probably immense. Your king's face, when he saw what the men had brought him, must have been priceless. And if that wasn't exciting enough... The next few minutes leave every single one of you speechless because your king refuses to drink it. After all these men have just done, he takes the water, but he would not drink of it, and he poured it out before the Lord. And now something strange happens. Far from getting angry, the hairs on the back of your neck begin to, to stand on end. And instinctively, you know that what you are experiencing is, is a special, holy, just other kind of overwhelmingly solemn moment. And you hear your king's voice praying, verse 17. Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went at risk to their own lives? Do you see what's going on here? David recognized that the act that had just been committed was far too, too precious, far too important just to be directed at him. The men had risked their own blood. How could he acknowledge that by using their precious gift just to quench his thirst? And no, he pours it all out to the Lord because he knows that the Lord is the only one worthy of such worship. This kind of act... This kind of sacrifice, this kind of love, of worship, of devotion, this, this kind of thing only belongs to the Lord. And David turns the spotlight from himself to the only one who deserves it. You know, I think I've seen something uh, similar on stage. Some of you may remember Martin Smith. He used to be the lead singer of a Christian band called Delirious. And he would often, when the crowd were cheering at him, point his, his finger to the heavens in a symbolic act. Not me but God. And what about those footballers who lift up their shirts, you know, when they score a great goal? It says, I belong to Jesus on it. 
Now, you may say to me, they're, they're trivial examples. In a way, I would, I would agree with you compared to what David did. But in their own way, these men, they are trying to shift the spotlight from themselves onto the one who is only, the only one, sorry, who is worthy of it. And like David, those men recognize that. So what about us? Surely part of what this passage of Scripture is teaching us is that unless we ensure that our devotion is directed towards the Lord, we risk turning people, turning things and possessions, our ambitions, our achievements, we run the risk of turning them into idols. The Lord is the only one worthy of our worship. Between verses 18 to uh, 23 then, there are two more stories of David's mighty men. We hear of Joab's brother Abishai, whose uh, slaughtering of the 300 gave him a special place of honor, and Benaniah, who took out a lion, uh, two aerials, which sounds pretty impressive, but I can't find anyone who actually knows what an aerial is, Um, but but there we go. And he also took out a giant Egyptian, just with a club and not uh, not a, a sword or a spear. There are two more impressive stories to, to add to those we've already heard, but there are two more violent stories to add to the violent stories we've already heard. And all of this leaves us with a problem. And it's a problem that we can't avoid. And that's our fourth heading. Because despite all of these achievements, the Lord's promise via Nathan to David and recorded in, in 2 Samuel 7 remains unfulfilled. What was that promise? Let me remind you. God said in 2 Samuel 7, through Nathan, he said, I will appoint a place for my people Israel so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more. And I will give you rest from your enemies. Is this what's happening in 2 Samuel 23? It's not, is it? The picture we have here is far from this reality. As one commentator notes, David and his men are celebrated because they overcome violence with violence. It's it's, it's a far cry from the kingdom of peace that Nathan is talking about. And so it begs a couple of questions, doesn't it? Why is it like that? And if not then, then when? When will this promise get fulfilled? Well, I think we get a hint of an answer to that first question. Why is it like that? in the final verses of the chapter. We didn't read them earlier, so just cast your eye over them uh, now, down to verse 24. If you look at verse 24, you'll see there's Ashael, the brother of uh, Joab. There's Elhanan. There's Shammah, another Shammah, El- Elika, Helez, Ira, uh, the list go on. They're not exactly uh, names that we are familiar with, are they? But just keep tracking, uh, tracking your eyes down and come down to the bottom of that list. Because right there at the end, as if out of nowhere, pops up a name that we should recognize. Do you see that? Verse 39, and Uriah the Hittite. This has got to make us think. All of these men are recorded for their devotion, for their service, for their achievements, for for their loyalty. They are David's mighty men. And he has one of them murdered to cover up his own sin. If you don't remember, Uriah was Bathsheba's husband. Bathsheba was the woman David lusted after, slept with, and got pregnant. Her husband was one of David's best. And David had him murdered in an attempt to cover up the whole sordid affair. It is a shocking reminder at the end of our chapter of the problem that none of us in our own strength can avoid. Our sin our rebellion against the Lord, our desire to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. That is why the kingdom hadn't come at that point, as Nathan has said it would. And it may seem like a hard and somber and negative place to leave the chapter. But actually it needn't be. Because the whole point is to make us look forward. And it is to signpost us to the time when the promise would be fulfilled. When the consequences of David's sin here, of your sin and my sin, would be dealt with conclusively 
by one of his descendants. It is, of course, supposed to signpost us to Jesus, to Jesus' life, to his, his sacrificial death, to his resurrection, and the establishment of that joyous kingdom that will never end. Which finally reminds us that there is a choice we all face. And that choice is between accepting the Lord's grace or facing his just condemnation for our rebellion against him. The murder of Uriah the Hittite isn't the end of the story, mercifully, for David. Yes, the consequences of his sin reverberated for centuries. But we also know that David responded the right way when Nathan confronted him about it. That's why he was able to pen those memorable words in in Psalm 51. They're words that show a heartfelt repentance, a sincere faith that the Lord would grant mercy, that he would grant forgiveness, and that he would give a new start. And so maybe you're here tonight longing for the chance to start over in some way. Maybe like David, you've been unwilling to acknowledge things are seriously wrong in your life. Or maybe it's just a case of keeping short accounts with the Lord. If any of that is you, then like David, choose grace. I urge you, humble yourself before the Lord, lest you risk his just and right condemnation for disobedience. Let's pray together as we close. And I'm going to pray uh, just some of those words from Psalm 51. As I say, they're memorable words. Dear Lord, please would you have mercy on us according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, Lord, please would you blot out our transgressions. Please, Lord, wash away all our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Create in us pure hearts, O God. Renew steadfast spirits within us. And restore unto us the joy of our salvation. And as we go into this week, please grant us willing spirits to sustain us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, before-